I'm Craig Hubbard, I'm the lead designer on Fear, and we're going to be doing commentary over some footage of the game. I'm David Longo, I'm the art director on the project. Hey, my name is Chris Hewitt, I'm the producer. My name is Kevin Steffens, and I am the technical director at Monolith Productions. I'm John Mulkey, I'm the lead level designer on Fear. I remember the, uh, this music was something that was placeholder and we just fell in love with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was originally intended for the end of the game, but... I moved it to the beginning. The eye is the thematic element that you'll find out about when you play the game. As well as killing lots of bad guys. That's another theme. So this opening cinematic kind of gives you a little window into the backstory of what happens right before the game begins. This guy that you're seeing here is Paxton Fettel, who you'll find out shortly is a uh, genetically engineered telepathic Psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> He's a psychic commander who can lead a squad of soldiers telepathically. So his scream is sort of reverberating through this facility and it awakens these clone soldiers. And a mutiny ensues. That character's interesting, the way the components have all come together. Fettel? Yeah. He actually, we started off with two villains, and he was one of them and kind of merged them together. Yep. Dr. Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. So he's got the body of one and the head of the other. Yep. The music in this opening is something that uh, was actually placeholder, but we really liked it and kind of fell in love with how it fit, so we wouldn't let the uh, audio director change it. It was originally going to be used at the end of the game, but we moved it to the beginning. So here the soldiers have pretty much mopped up the security forces at the facility, and uh, Fettel is doing his thing. I think it's important to point out that Fettel has a really bitchin' jacket. <laughs> <clears throat> his jacket actually used to belong to another villain we had in the game named Conrad Krieg, who we chopped out of the game and combined with Fettel pretty literally. We were all, we were very nervous about this scene being completely, completely black and I think it actually worked really well. They isolated the conversation and, and that great acting that the voice actors did. I spent a lot of time on the timing of these titles to get it so it didn't feel too dead. So this, <clears throat> this briefing was inserted He's the key. After we did some initial playtesting on the opening part of the game and found that players didn't really understand exactly what had happened, so we wanted to put it in a little more context. What's his story? It's actually a good example of some of the technology with the videos playing in the background. There's like about eight different videos playing. Top secret, of course. It also is a way to introduce fear as an organization and kind of give you an idea of who you're this is why you're working with seriously. and what your clothes, team does. A full battalion of them, highly trained and heavily armed. The team kind of changed over the course of the project too. What are we supposed to do against a thousand super We originally had a, like I said, another demolitions expert, over. and I think each the point of the each team member had a unique sort of skill, but you changed that over time. Danger. Just to simplify the storytelling, the, the gameplay. All those yeah, once we had given them each a uh, <clears throat> some sort of ability, we really needed to see it used in the game, and it just sort of put a lot of requirements on us in terms of what types of scenes we would have to have to support it, and we just preferred to put our time into stuff that's more about the player. The guy on the left is uh, modeled after one of the Monolith employees. His head, that is. All right, let's get to work. We've tracked Fettel to an abandoned building just up ahead. No sign of enemy activity on the satellite. What's interesting is we actually chances. had a whole level in the position. game where we actually had this car. We're doing right, a car chase sequence, and uh, 
Luckily, we got to use the car. <laughs> yeah. It's been about, what, two months on that thing? At least. The car chase sequence just didn't work out the way we hoped it would, so... This area is an area that helps uh, really present that big open city kind of kind of concept. Try not to throw you directly into a claustrophobic kind of dungeon crawl situation. We also wanted to introduce some of the gameplay concepts in a relatively low risk environment, so we use it as a mixture of a training level and also a, a means of establishing the mood of the game and some of the backstory. find a way around. This environment went through fairly rapid iteration, actually late in the development process. Uh, this level was one of the last levels that we actually built um, from the ground up, and so uh, the iteration process was quicker than some of the other levels in the game. Um, but luckily, we were at a position where we understood our technology and understood kind of the constraints, so it made it a lot easier for us to, to attack a level like this late. We also had a lot of content at this point that we could evaluate what type of environment we could build relatively rapidly and also one that would you wouldn't be seeing again for a while in the game so avoid a feeling of repetition Get your first dynamic or volumetric lighting there yeah you can see it on the left why nice. you bring me back we used to have Alma walking past the doorway there. The uh, character we had there, I think, works a little better. Yeah, it works a lot better with Fettel, I think, this whole level. I really like that sequence of the door slamming in your the face baby. <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. Baby, like baby crying, crying is scary. Yeah. 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 I like the physics, uh, um, too, on the, the paint cans in the chair. The disturbances of the poultrygeist activity. Yeah, I don't know what, quite what's going on. This is a little bit of a challenge setting it up because it had initially kind of a haunted house feel because there were events in every single room, so spreading them out a little more improved the pacing. Yeah. yeah the you want to be careful. You know, it's it's easy to fall into that rhythm. Yeah, where it becomes predictable. Yeah. You walk in and you're expecting, okay, what's going to happen? Come on. This was another situation where we... Go. Decided to mess with the player's expectations a little bit. Yeah, we start to blur the lines here of what's real and what's not. Originally, we had mapped out a much more sort of conventional scene where you guys both bust into the room together and find the body, but just for pacing, it felt a lot better to get rid of Jankowski and put you in this hallucination. This is the first victim uh, of Fettel, isn't it? Well, technically the second, but the first Looks one that you find. We see in the game, yeah. Just leftovers. The transmitter signal's coming from nearby. It's gotta be around there somewhere. I'll wait here for Jin. You take a look around. Get going. Another area that evolved quite a bit in the later stages of the project. A lot of the outside uh, foliage and buildings. Ow. That's how we end every level. <laughs> Smack you in the face with a board. The dead man's name was Marshal Dizzler. I 
remember him. But are the memories mine or hers? So this is actually another <laughs> one of those examples of wanting to convey story information to the player, but wanting to keep it all as much in-game as possible. And if you leave the player in control, you run the risk that they're going to just run off and miss something important. So we came up with some devices for locking you into a, an area to give you some information that would feel a little more contextual. We used to have Alma running past that window. That's right. We'll be ready. What do you think of the new point, man? Hey, uh, where you been? There's actually a conversation there you can eavesdrop on if you don't go running down the stairs. Oh, I really like that conversation too. It took me a while before I heard it. Really? Like, I'm working on the level after a while. At one point, I just stopped up at the top of the stairs and finally heard it. And it was cool. Come on, make a push! I've tried to forget. I've tried so hard to forget. These men are special attachments to our unit for the duration of this op. They will be on point. Their mission is to assess the nature of the threat. Our job is to keep them alive. Do Holiday actually used to be part of the fear team, but we didn't have enough for him to do as part of the team, so we made him a Delta Force guy who could just show up periodically without needing a lot of explanation for it. When he was part of the fear team, you needed to know where he was at any given moment and why he wasn't there with you. Was he still the uh, demolition guy back then? Yeah, he was the demolition guy. Quite a few iterations on the water. Started with uh, something that was a lot more complex, but didn't look as good. I thought it would be nice to let you actually come in on a helicopter and fast rope down as opposed to just watching the whole thing in a cutscene. Yeah, that was kind of an ongoing theme wherever possible. Keep the player in the game. Point. See if you can get this gate open. I'd send one of my boys, but I think we need a specialist for this one. The sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had to re record the line to get a little more sarcasm in there and didn't come across <laughs> the first time. Goody. One of the play testers was confused that he was waiting for the specialist to show up, <laughs> didn't realize that he was the specialist. If you want to, you can beat on those boxes all day long and they'll move around. Good job. Head on back. What do you think the chances they'll still be doing okay when you get down there? I'm sure everything will be fine. This is a scene where we had a lot of iterations on. I really like the vision that he ended up putting in there. It's kind of recycling some elements from the original E3 demo. a fairly late addition too was the uh, the effect of having the early on we had the bodies basically just kind of turn into pinatas and explode 
with and candy. <laughs> Well, the skeletons were always on my wish list because I just find skeletons a little disturbing when they got <clears throat> blood and meat on them. This one is a big challenge for us trying to introduce the enemies for the very first time. Yeah. It's amazing how many playtesters don't realize that they're bad even watching them shoot an innocent bystander. Yeah, we had a lot of different soldier types good guys and bad guys and so it was important for people to understand which ones are the ones that I should shoot at. <laughs> Always get a good response when showing that to people in the demo of the game. Just those little things add so much. painting the soldiers as the bad guys. This actually used to be the first level in the game, but we didn't want to start off in a, a warehouse, so we moved to the second level. Just to extend the minutes to create. Seconds to create. Seconds. Yeah. This is what we're introducing to back there, the breaking boards, some of the, the components that you'll need to understand as you move through the game, some of the simple puzzle elements, obstacle overcoming, overcoming simple obstacles, that kind of thing. Melee combat. This is also a level, this area was set up to uh, allow the player to get a kind of a jump on the AI. Yeah, wherever possible we try to let the player initiate combat just to give you a sense of control and tactical decision making. A lot of navigational options open to the AI in this level too, which is nice. Get that sense of an open environment to fight in. Yeah, melee was something we wanted to try early on. It was definitely uh, kind of a component we felt fit really well into a close quarters combat experience and so um, we, we fought pretty hard to keep it in and at least you know let the play play testers decide there's a major engineering time sink but yeah. that feature in I think we had Russ working on just having the player body be able to be seen it took about three months at least yeah. just with all the animation yeah. issues yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely added a lot of a lot of challenges on the 3d side yeah I mean the whole core of our game is obviously the the shooting aspect and when you change, fundamentally change that, it, it's a pretty big task. Slow-mo was also another feature that <clears throat> originally we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do it, if we were going to pull it off. Um, something Craig had wanted pretty much from day one. <laughs> from day one of Nolf 2. Yeah, <laughs> for a long time. I remember when we put that in, you actually purposely did not want to show me <laughs> the feature when John O had first got it implemented. Yeah. Because I'd run off and tell people, hey, we got slow-mo. Yeah, John O'Rourke, uh, the engine architect, uh, first uh, implemented, re-implemented the timer system to uh, support uh, changing the gameplay speed, and, and uh, it was, uh, even his initial test, it was really cool, and we knew that people were going to really like it, so we, on purpose, didn't show it right away because uh, it's really easy for people to get very excited about a feature when all the details haven't been figured out, so I was, I was, uh, it was kind of a stealth feature for a while. Is limping. Yeah. Damage. Damage levels. That was one of the 
fun parts coming up with how much how much stuff can we put in the environment that's going to be destructible and bounce around one shot. Tell the person who played uh, this game and played the, the earlier level. <laughs> They're looking for a med kit that we moved. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting when we were obviously trying to focus on close quarters combat. You know, I wasn't sure quite what Craig was looking for when, but when he brought in the the John Woo films and you know showed a couple of the scenes where the guy shoots the the shotgun down like a. A blank hallway and just all hell breaks loose and debris and smoke and sparks and it was just very clear to to see exactly what Craig was was going for and I think we really captured it well. I think one of my favorite effects is when you shoot these boxes and the paper is floating in the air and just how it all lingers and fills the area makes it feel very chaotic. Yeah, I like it on all the different materials and, and when we're going through the levels we were looking at an area has a lot of stone, I try to add in some wood or something that'll give paper debris so you're not just seeing the same thing over and over again. Mm. Just get that variety of chaos and crap in the air. You know, they're trying to make it all larger than life too so that it feels like an action movie and not like CNN footage. After the very beginning, the uh, Matrix 1 lobby scene with Neo and Trinity where they shoot up the lobby, was that was kind of our Poster child. Yeah. yeah, that was the bar we were aiming for. I remember when we, uh, I was telling the story in the interview about the, the sparks and how when we got it in there, it, to me it just seemed way too over the top, even though I felt like, you know, we needed obviously that type of uh, destruction and in, in, um, eye candy, but, you know, just a couple of days later you just couldn't get enough of it, and yeah. Wes really did a great job just... Wes Salisbury? Yep. Wes Salisbury. There was a lot of financing that went on too. I mean, a lot of very subtle things. I mean, I think that we kept the same number, but you know, we shrank them a little bit. There were some sparks that felt more like fireworks that would yes. spin around. Yeah, we still have those. Yeah, it's great. They, they happen. But it's like it's the frequency. Like yeah. we, you know, there was a lot of just massaging the the numbers a little bit. Mm -hmm. I remember when we things. set up that demo, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to. Or, Vivendi almost didn't show the game at E3 in 2004, and uh, we were getting down to like we literally had two weeks before they were going to decide what was going to be shown at E3, and one of the pushes um, that we made was to, to create some demos of the gameplay, because we had just gotten online a lot of the enhanced effects systems, and we showed just a little piece to, to Sierra, and they were so blown away by what we had done that they had convinced them that they had to show it at E3. You had mentioned the, the effects and how quickly you become acclimated to it and you have those expectations. The melee was really one of those that, that I latched onto because I would be playing a different game, you know, that someone else had made and I really found myself missing that component. I'd, I'd run up on an enemy in another game and try to leap try, to kick him. You know, yeah, try to, <laughs> try to just take him out and it just felt so empty, you know, by comparison. I do that with the slow-mo as well. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it really sells you know, drives it home that it's it's a good addition. It's something that really you, you latch on to. I think the whole uh, kind of lighting environment and the player body is one of those things that has that effect on me too, looking down and being able to see your legs and seeing your shadow. Um, matching and up with the animations. And everything yeah. matching and, and the lighting matching on, on the models and on the world. and um, That's something where, you know, a lot of games that have kind of mixed renders, I have, I have a hard time when, you know, the model stands out. It's like the old point and clicks of adventure games where you know exactly what's going to move and what's not. Yeah. 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 In here. Check the floor. Yes, sir. It's a good example of uh, mm -hmm. kind of a variety of combat animations. This is another one of those situations where, you know, we built in a, a non-linear path here so that lots of opportunities for the combat and it could just emerge in different ways depending upon what the player does. That was a big push. Left. Yeah, it was a big push. Keep it open-ended. So how'd you set the AI up in here, John? <laughs> uh, I told one of my level designers. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they did it. That was pretty Someone cool. Someone wet themselves. This okay. is pretty cool. I like the, the reflection and the, the puddles. That's pretty awesome. 
That's another area where we kind of um, went a little bit away from the norm on, on kind of the decapitation and things like that, where we we supported some amount of carnage, but we, we really wanted it to, to, you know, fit in. We didn't want it to be too over the top, but we also wanted it to be, you know, satisfying for the, the player. It's a very occasional thing, and we wanted it to feel a little more like a war movie where it's grisly but not sort of self-indulgent. With that grenade effect was the uh, probably one of the most commented on effects in the game when we showed it at E3. And it was just interesting how we actually almost pulled it out because we thought it maybe had been just too unrealistic. Yeah, I, I loved the win. I loved watching you play uh, early iterations of the game for people. And uh, you, Chris, were particularly uh, <laughs> uh, in love with the grenade and the shattering glass. I remember every scene was hit slow-mo, throw the grenade, watch the glass blow up. It was awesome. A lot of the early responses we had to the E3 video were that the, the grenades were causing the slow-mo. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. I really like how the enemies, when they get shot up, they're still firing their weapon. I remember one moment I captured this scene where I actually ripped the guy in half and his torso, upper torso, still had the weapon and they're still firing, shooting at the glass around him. It feels like a like a total action movie. There's, there's sequences where you'll be in slow-mo He'll have a weapon that you don't have. You you nail him in slow mo. He's he's shooting the gun and falling to the ground. And you just as you walk through him, grab the gun from him <laughs> and start shooting the next guy. It feels have awesome. you ever done the moment like where you shoot the guy and the guy's weapon flying through the air in slow mo and you can actually catch it? Yes, and switch? That yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. That's one of the things about this game. I mean, I was the guy that pretty much did ninety percent of the video captures, That's and um, it was. Uh, there's so many moments where it just felt like this is just the perfect action movie sequence right here. I mean, we play this game. I mean, I, I'm wondering how many hours I've played this thing. Like, 300 hours, and you still get impressed by some of the things. I had a cool, happens. cool sequence the other day. I came into a room, and there was a conference room table, and there was a guy on the near side of the table and a guy on the far side of the table and I went into slow, mo slow motion and did a triple kick mm -hmm. and I nailed the guy on the near side and basically rode his body across the conference room table and then killed the you know nailed the other guy on the other side and took him out it was it was an awesome <laughs> awesome moment body surfing yep this scene changed quite a bit there's a lot yeah. of iterations on this scene Jankowski used to die here yeah he was actually pinned up on that wall crucifix style yep. with, uh, some beams. That would be a lot more interesting if you don't know what's happened to him and if we can sort of keep some suspense about that. Where are we going? We're exploring. It's, you found the secret and it's all for naught. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You've got be something nothing. right there. I like this really strong plastic yeah. wrap that kept all those boxes perfectly assembled. So there used to be prox mines down here that was supposedly laid down by Pax and Fettel as he's been escaping, but right before GDC, we decided to, you know, based on some feedback we got, just to throw Alma in here and have her be the cause of the explosion. And it actually worked great because this was the end of the GDC demo. And at the beginning of the GDC demo, we had the fire in the eye and it just really kind of closed off the demo really well. Yeah, these, these effects uh, were again, Wes Salisbury and Kevin Diedrich. Uh, spent a lot of energy making these effects look, you know, realistic, really. Um, had a few uh, people actually at uh, GDC 2005, uh, European press, talking about how it was the best fire they'd seen in the game. He's alive. Should I call in a medevac? He doesn't appear to be injured. Jen's gone through a lot of Although iterations, too. Yeah. She used to be a sniper, but in order for her to really be a sniper, she has to do some sniping, and we just didn't have opportunities in the game to really make that work so so she's got the padding on her forearms for being able to lock crawl down and to get to get a good stable position for sniping the trigger finger is red you're lucky to be alive thanks chum that's a guy I, I like to try to kill for some reason every time i play this level <laughs> he's just standing there I want he's asking gun. for it aren't there, they all there's an interesting bug uh 
where when you're on the ground and Jin's talking to you, if you move the mouse, the, the soldier next to her, his head would shake because he was trying to uh, watch you where you're looking. It was really funny. He could make him look like he had some kind of strange, I don't know, sickness or something. I think for this game, dock workers are the new scientist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These guys hate the, the dock workers. In there, yeah. <laughs> Tormented by the bad guys. It was nice going to the system we used for this uh, this project. We went to an actual metric system in our editor. So uh, on previous projects, we had to spend a lot of time making scale standards to make sure the world was convincing. And uh, on this one, we just bought all the designers measuring tapes and <laughs> said, there you go, now you've got your scale standard. It was nice. So this is a part in the game where we've kind of gone back and forth on whether to keep it or not. Yeah, this was supposed to break up the uh, the combat with some kind of exploratory elements. Here's another like, one of our storytelling devices that we use, it which is these like phones where you can hear voicemail messages. To which are the sad. phones we have here at Monolith. Yeah, yeah these phones are exactly <laughs> like the ones at our desks. And actually the woman who does the voice acting for the voice message actually does that. She's a voice actress, but she also does voicemail voice acting, so she may be the actual voice of the people on our phone system. The links we go to for realism. Exactly. That's another thing that early on we wanted to use uh, the kind of ladder climb that's found in some more of the tactical games instead of uh, the traditional uh, kind of first-person shooter um, just kind of you know magically um, glue yourself up and down ladders which is definitely a design decision um, that you know maybe Craig wants to talk a little bit more about. <laughs> well one of the things that it does is it makes you vulnerable on a ladder so there's a little bit more tension involved in deciding to climb up to another level in a firefight for example. It's a lot more advantageous to try and deal with the threat than the rats are running away from <laughs> something. But there can't be anything good down there. We actually had Alma here pull straight back into the, the darkness. Now we have her running across, which I think worked out really well. Yeah, this area definitely got iterated on multiple times, and I definitely think it ended up a lot better. Well, we ran into a problem with that original setup because players can adjust their gamma, and so you could see her disappearing and appearing. So it's another case where the dynamic nature of PC games really requires you to be creative in how you solve problems. It's also another good example here of uh, the lighting and shadowing that our technology supports to allow for you to see, you know, Alma behind you and her shadow on the wall in front of you. There went a fresh shipment of bad guys. in the water, having things float with the new physics system is pretty cool. That's what I usually say when somebody shoots me in the head. <laughs> sure. That's another good example of kind of a different direction we went with the enemies. A little bit more um, <clears throat> realistic reactions to being shot at. <laughs> That guy there got shot and fell on his ass and then had to get back up. I thought that was... I loved that addition of being able to yeah, shoot some guys and top. have them recoil. Yeah, that is all our names, isn't it? <laughs> You're at the top, Kevin. That, I know. It's because I complain to the world artists. <laughs> so they finally... <laughs> they finally put me in the game after about a, a year of complaining about it. It's fun to listen to you complain. Yeah, that's yeah, what I realized after a while. <laughs> <laughs> I realized after a while they want me to complain, so... I'll, and they got sick of it and they put you in the game a couple yeah. times. Yeah. On the generator. This room is kind of interesting because this is something, this room was actually built really, really early in the prototyping phases. And uh, we were putting down the combat sequences through here, putting them together, and uh, ended up pulling this out of the kind of the archive 
and uh, reworking it a little bit and dressing it up, and I think it works out pretty well for a combat scenario. Yeah, that was something that kind of was a common theme where we would have uh, combat spaces that were worked on really early with without final art, and they moved around a lot of times, like something would be, you know, initially in kind of this early area in the game, it's like, well, maybe this would work in the office, and so it got moved to the office, or vice versa. It was cool working in those discrete little scenes. We just put together elements that would fit contextually into the, into the, you know, the various areas we were creating, and uh, just work out the combat and, and different elements and make them feel cool. Or not. <laughs> nah, it always felt cool. Sure it did. Yeah, part of the reason we wanted that more modular approach is so that we could adjust pacing by shifting scenes around fairly easily instead of being locked into a layout. Yeah, that was a big concern early on, was just the pacing being so important to the game that we really didn't want to be locked into something that didn't work well for pacing. This is one of those rooms where we thought it was pretty fun to fight here. We thought it was pretty cool. Um, we had a lot of performance concerns for this space, and it ended up going through a lot of iterations. I think it turned out pretty nice, though. Well, actually, speaking of the modular approach, this is also a room that at various points you've entered from at least three different directions. <laughs> That's true. bomb. <laughs> Chris has to uh, take his crazy pills right now. So. <laughs> this is another one of those spaces that changed around so much. There used to be an alternate route into the space that ended up getting pulled out and used to be a big combat scene here too. See, at the beginning of the project, we were told not to have any more than three AI, and then also make sure not to have combat with water. So we put five AI in here and put the combat in with the water. <laughs> yeah. For any of you people out there that are thinking about becoming an engineer or an artist in a game company, pick artists because you can kind of do whatever you want, and then the engineers have to clean up after you. Don't pick engineer. I don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> this is that complaining we were talking about yeah, earlier. Exactly. It is interesting, though, how early on, kind of the constraints that we thought we were going to have to deal with, um, really, you know, we, we kind of worked around, like, because early it was three AIs, it was, you know, like, yeah. three lights. Yeah. And both no of those. No bridges and a no, few columns. No water. Yeah. No moving platforms. Yeah. Yeah, some of the first spaces, I remember people looking at us going, we can't do that. Yeah. We've got to pull back. Don't, don't even try. But now we have six AI at a time and 22 yeah. visible lights and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Kevin What's our spec? It. Yeah. Yeah. What's our min spec? Exactly. It's tricky, too, because I think the average gamer doesn't understand <clears throat> why they can't look at the scene and understand why it would run slower on their machine than an older game, but... I think it's just the, because the real, you know, the per pixel lighting and the dynamic yeah. shadows. I think the biggest wake up call is when I found out that uh, every light that hits a model, it has to re render that model. So if you've got three guys in there with what three lights, right? You're running about the model basically the equivalent of nine guys in the room. So from yeah, a it's rendering just not standpoint. the models. It's it's any surface. It's you know for every light that hits a surface, it has to re-render that surface, and depending on how expensive it is to render the surface, it can add up quite quickly. And that's one of the reasons why uh, resolution is such a a big uh, performance drain too. Is higher resolutions, there's more pixels, so you're rendering you know more pixels more times, and it, it slows down the frame rate quite a bit. A laptop was another example of a storytelling device where you can activate it and upload some data and then there's your David. coordinator. Hey, there's David on the left. Oh, yeah, there he is. Yeah. And there's yeah, been, been Andy Grant. <laughs> Andy Grant. Yeah. Good luck, New York, Andy. T 
TPS report. I know, some of those papers are hanging up in our hallways. Yummy, yummy grenades. Oh, that clock used to actually keep accurate time. <laughs> they forced me to pull wall, it out. That clock, that black clock on the wall. Yeah. Actually, yeah. all the hands moved accurately and kept accurate time. Uh, the John Mulkey, the lead level designer, hooked yeah. it all up. Probably spent way too much time getting it to work. Two minutes. And then uh, us in engineering said, um, you know, this is actually <laughs> not good for performance. Um, so could you please like make it so it doesn't actually keep accurate time? It's going to keep this game from being AAA. You know that, don't you? See, we try hard, very hard, <laughs> to make everything as realistic as possible. But there's sometimes constraints. There's limits. So here's an example of a space that we inserted for pacing reasons because we felt you'd been inside for quite a while in tighter, more closed-in areas, so getting you out into the under the sky was a nice change of pace. Originally when you went, went out into the space, it was from the other side too. But compositionally, it just looks a lot better entering where you do now. This is actually one of my favorite combat spaces. It's, I've probably played this space 30 times, and combat's different every time, and it's always satisfying. There used to be a big air conditioning thing up on the wall there <laughs> that you could shoot and knock onto a guy, but we couldn't convey it to the player well enough, so we just pulled it. Dead. <laughs> there we go. That hurt. There's an example of a good rifle butt. Yep. The body impact effects was something that I really liked. There was a lot of sequences early on where you'd, you know, shoot a guy and throw him off a balcony and he would fall to the, ba to the, to the floor below. And uh, Kevin hooked it up for the, uh, the big bloody print <laughs> impacts yeah. and just oh, well, the Brad feels Fendleton, tasty. Lead engineer actually made that work. I oh, Brad did that? I prototyped it, but he's, he's the one that actually made it shippable. So yeah, That's another cool thing too. Makes the, me uh, giddy. The impact <laughs> that, that looks like it recesses into the wall. Yeah. Displays the offset happy. shader. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the offset shader um, for the a lot of the bricks, I really think, you know, pulls them out and makes them feel real. And the uh, offset shader for the impact marks definitely adds a ton. This is another one of those spaces that originally you actually came into this from the far side of the room, uh, swimming through an underground tunnel um, to enter a facility. And this is something that just through reworking the layouts and making the game work with the story, it... Uh, changed around quite a bit. It's a good example of our, our water technology which allows for uh, accurate reflections on the surface and also you notice that the surface is being displaced um, as you move through it. So that was something that we spent a fair amount of time on and it's used in a few places in the game. One of the challenging things about trying to incorporate these scary moments is, you know, when we play the game hundreds of times and see them over and over again, we start to lose perspective of whether they're still scary or not. So there's been so many moments where we've been tempted to pull, and, and a lot of them probably have been pulled because of that. So we purposely kind of held back on putting some of those moments in just so we didn't get numb to them. Yeah, That was definitely a challenge for the first-person perspective, too. And, you know, Craig talked about the cinematics, and getting someone to get the story information. Um, those scary moments and uh, different presentations of combat was a big challenge just in trying to uh, set up the composition so that the player was most likely to see the things that you wanted them to see. Went through a lot of iteration on different situations to, to accomplish that. And in our play testing, it's guaranteed that somebody's going to miss a big <laughs> chunk of stuff. I'm famous for always looking left. <laughs> anything, anytime anything happens, I look left. Some of the level designers actually compensate for that by putting things to the left. <laughs> yeah. Everything goes left. His life signs are a little unusual, but he's definitely alive. He's got to be around there somewhere. I'll keep looking. It's actually a really good example of the water, the buoyancy, reflection. 
Sploosh. The ripples from the player. Yep. Oh, this is cool dynamic lighting here. Or fog. Yeah, biometric lighting. Biometric. Yeah, one of them words. <laughs> Your level designer. Yeah, okay. I don't understand these things. This is a moment that always gets a good response in the play tests. Yeah. Seeing the shadow of the guy. I always like to melee him here. Yeah. Yeah, everybody yep. always <laughs> approaches this guy differently. I like the shotgun through the window. <laughs> yeah. Slow mo. I like the slide kick. Yeah. Just to make sure. The jump kick's actually a good one. Yeah. I do the roundhouse there. Double guns. <laughs> Whose idea was it to put a wrench on the calendar? I remember uh, that's probably Ken's idea. No, I remember Andrew worked about Andrew. that. Was it? Yeah, I was actually watching hmm. when he was doing it. Only well, calendars used to be 1984 <laughs> for a long time. That's kind of cool, though. Yeah, is that like a like a shout out to Van Halen? Oh, it's a George, George Orwell. Yeah. Oh, Orwell. Okay. Of course, that's <laughs> that's the other thing I think of. Right. Van Halen. Van Halen first, then Orwell. Then, yeah. then Orwell. Yeah. You know, got my priorities straight. Exactly. It's cool. The, co the caustics lighting is pretty sweet. Yeah. It's actually a video. Shh. Shh. <laughs> tell our secrets. No, I'm, it's all good. I'm just kidding. More volumetric lighting. The feature that I was just wanting so badly. Good catch. This space actually went through quite a few revisions too. Yep. Originally there was a pool down there. But uh combat and water again. <laughs> yeah. They don't mix. Yeah. Oh, yikes. It's a good example of the uh, slide kick. Yeah. It's a good example of uh, smoke kind of lingering around. <laughs> it's like, something happened here. Biggest tactical challenges for the player up till this point in the game. Yeah, I really like this combat space. It feels very, uh, there's just so much going on, so much flanking, and it's so open ended. A lot of people have said that it feels, uh, it has a multiplayer feel to it. Yeah. I'm impressed that we pulled it off. You know, it's a big area. And Bad guys. guys. Performance is pretty good. This is one of those ones that uh, went through a lot of uh, lighting iterations. Leo De Bruin, uh, one of our level designers, he went through and, and lit this most recently, and I think he did a great job. Yeah, of he did. Really popping out the contrast and and yet making it feel like it has an ambient to it. It's really nice. Did a great job on it, and it runs faster. <laughs> it's great. Definitely a, a, a level that demonstrates the the uh, how dynamic the AI are. 
in responding to the player and how the player is moving through the space and what they're doing and the choices they're making. Yeah, I would it's play cool. it completely differently. Mm -hmm. Played it again. Oh, oh. Catch. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, there goes a head. Yep. <laughs> Shotgun. Yeah, take the shotgun. Yeah. Shotgun, I think, is my favorite weapon. I love using the shotgun and melee as a combo. Shotgun, melee, and slow mo. <laughs> as a combo, which is great. One of the things I'm happiest about is that instead of ragdoll physics, we have stuntman physics. The way the guys fly is much more like movie stuntmen. Yeah. As we're about to witness. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that's nice. First props that was made with the radio. Yeah. I like this uh, this puzzle here where you turn on the water. It's actually a good example of a sound feature that uh, Terry Jones, our audio engineer, implemented that is uh, allows you to string a sound along kind of a instead of being around a radius, it's actually following the pipe. So as you move down the pipe. You can hear the water the whole time, but you don't hear it in here. Yeah, still got the positional. Yeah, which is cool. Which is, you know, very realistic. tough one because you know I'd like having some of those puzzle elements but there's a lot of gamers that get frustrated so we end up pulling back on them quite a bit. This is a good co combat space as well. This is one of my favorites. A lot of uh, high variation guys above you. <laughs> Just keeps He's retreating. This area oh. was actually one of the first combat prototype areas we built. <laughs> Nasty. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, this yeah. is the area where we did the the first demo that got us into E3 2004, and we actually used it in the uh, E3 demo 2005, which is pretty funny. It's still one of my favorite combat spaces in the game. Yeah, first screenshot. Yeah, yeah. right here. <laughs> that's a that's what a good the story. Infamous, yeah. yeah. Bullets taste like chicken. Yeah, we uh, our first screenshot that we thought only uh, the press was ever gonna see. Yep. was in this area and we had a caption uh, bullets taste like chicken hope you're hungry hope yeah. you're hungry yeah which is a total joke but yeah uh, we didn't think that it would ever get out but of course <laughs> it, 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 did. Yeah. it happens yeah. and it was taken seriously so yeah but they really do taste like chicken they do that's my understanding there's our pachinko boy <laughs> yeah, that's got hurt. required. Yeah, you gotta have the pachinko machine. It's too quiet. Don't trust it. <laughs> I've I think this person's played this before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dynamic lighting, another example. 
Some trepidation. He's just working his way up to it. What's he worried about? So one of our goals in the game is each time we introduce a new element, a new character, a new enemy, we wanted to try and make it dramatic, memorable. So you'll see an illustration of that with the heavy armor. The situation right here really just highlights the whole core concept behind the game. Just, just full on action movie action. Except for that part. It's kind of where it all comes together. You got the slow mo, you got the effects, you got the combat, physics, physics. smoke, carnage. Yeah, and lots of blood. And that's pretty much all. <laughs> I don't have any idea what the hell I'm supposed to say. Oh man. That's why we're in the game development business, so we don't have to be on yeah, camera. This is the first introduction to those loose gas pipes that you can blow up and use against the enemy. Uh, so he just got wall. nailed. Nailed to the wall. That's what you get. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> those are warning shots. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, that's getting a little, uh, a little gratuitous abusive, there. Yeah. <laughs> Save your nails. This, this area always reminds me of the <clears throat> the process that we use to build these a lot of these spaces, but it's just to start off with a completely simplistic environment, totally gray materials on the walls, just to get the, the feel of the space and of how the game mechanics would work within it, and then to go back and detail it up. Using the grid texture, it also made it really easy to just look at something and say, you know, pull it back a meter, 50 centimeters. I think that was really, yeah, it was a great thing to, to work that way. You didn't get caught up in the details. You were, you were able to just concentrate on the composition and what the play was going to be. This used to be a much longer cinematic, but I just distilled it down to this little snippet of the interrogation. Kind of an ongoing theme throughout the game, trying to kind of leave more to the player's imagination than spell it out for them. There's a good example of a a little scene that was originally somewhere else entirely, but I think that one actually moved around twice. Yeah, <laughs> it was originally blocked in in one space, got moved into another one, and then finally pulled into here. All right. It's All right. horrible. That's oh, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> How could guys this boring make something this cool? <laughs>